Our third talk today uh, celebrates the RAS Group Achievement Award in Geophysics, which went to the ISCAT um, Consortium. And uh, they are represented today by Ian McRae of the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And he will talk on ISCAT 3D, the future of incoherent scatter radars. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, yes, and... and Thank you for, to the RAS for um, giving us this award. It's a, it's a great honour for the ISCAT Association. In some ways, it's a bit of a lifetime achievement award because the association is actually 35 years old this year. Uh, and so the, some of the achievements that we've done and which have earned us this award really is the sum of achievements of, of a scientific community that runs into thousands now. Uh, some of whom are sitting in this room, actually, so it, it's nice to, to, to see those here. But, but um, uh, in, in no sense is this the work of one individual. This is the work of a really large community who've built, operated, and exploited these facilities that I'm going to show you. And we wanted to talk not so much about what we've done in the past, although I guess that will become obvious uh, in, in the slides that I show you, but about what we're going to do, because this community is... Um, still very ambitious, we still have a, a, a lot that we want to do and new facilities that we want to develop. Um, so what is the ISCAT Scientific Association? Well, it's an organization based in Sweden. It's actually an international research infrastructure. It was founded in 1975. Of course, at that time, we had no instruments. Um, the headquarters is still in Kiruna in Sweden, and all our facilities are in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Uh, which includes Svalbard, uh, halfway between the north coast of Norway and the North Pole. Um, we now have six member countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, UK, Japan, and China. In the past, we have had France and Germany as members of the association, so their scientific communities too have helped us uh, get to where we are now. We also have a separate class of membership which we call affiliate membership, which allows people to sign up with less long-term commitments to the association, um, but to buy time, essentially, on our facilities and run experiments. And at the moment, Russia, France, Ukraine, and South Korea are in that position. Uh, we're also working, as I'll show you, uh, more and more with the European Space Agency. And we're having discussions with another, a number of other countries who we think will join us in the near future, particularly the United States and South Africa. Um, if you went to our facilities today, what you would see is something like this. So this is the kind of thing, I guess, that everybody thinks of when they think of radars. These large dishes, they're cassegrain fed, so they, they're parabolic dishes coming to a, a focus uh, at a secondary above the dish. Um, in all cases but one, actually. Um, we have this strange-looking beast in Tromso in northern Norway, which is actually the size of a football field. It's 120 metres this way and about 40 metres this way. This is our VHF radar. And the reason that we have radars at a number of different frequencies is that we're tuned to different regions of near-Earth space. So we're really coming down now from the far-flung reaches of the galaxy to the nearest regions of, of what, what we call space, what you might even call the upper atmosphere. So these radars are probing the region between about 70 kilometers above our heads and about 1,000 kilometers above our heads. Um, the reason there are so many is that the Earth's magnetic environment is a complicated place. So we are simultaneously in... Oops, sorry, I'll go back one. Uh, we are simultaneously in the auroral zone uh, with these Tromso, Kiruna, and Sodankula radars and in what we call the polar cap, with the Svalbard radars, and the Earth's magnetic topology is different in those places. In Scandinavia, the Earth's magnetic topology is basically closed, so we're looking at magnetic field lines that reconnect back to the Earth's surface via, in some cases, a, a substantial journey into, into space. On Svalbard, we're looking at magnetic field lines that are open to the Earth's geospace environment. How does the technique work? The nice thing about it is, is that actually the signals we get are very weak, and that helps us to do uh, some very interesting science. Um, what we do, of course, with a radar, we broadcast uh, a monochromatic uh, radio pulse up into the Earth's upper atmosphere. Most of that signal actually winds up getting lost out into space, but the tiny part 
that get scattered back from each consecutive altitude of the atmosphere uh, tells us a lot about the geophysical properties of that region. So we transmit a monochromatic frequency pulse. We get back a spread spectrum. The shape and the power of that spread spectrum then enables us to, infor to, to inform us about the, the, the density of the atmosphere, the density of the ionized part of the atmosphere, the temperature of the atmosphere, and there are multiple temperatures because the electron and the ion population of the atmosphere are thermally decoupled at these altitudes. Um, it can inform us about the composition of the upper atmosphere because there are different molecules and atoms that dominate at different heights. Um, it can tell us about the collision frequency of the ionosphere. And because we have three spatially distributed sites looking into a common volume from different angles, we can get three-dimensional vector information on how the upper atmosphere is moving around. So this is really a very powerful technique. And of course, because our, our scattered signal at every altitude is so small, we get signals from multiple altitudes from where we begin to pick up the free electrons of the ionosphere to where we begin to run out of electrons to scatter from. So we've got to, we can probe a very large altitude region indeed. Let me move on. We're not the only radar like this in the world. Um, the Americans uh, operate a chain of radars going down the US continent, actually starting in, in Greenland and Sonderstrom, down through Millstone Hill. This is the famous Arecibo facility that many of you are familiar with. It doesn't just do radio astronomy. It has a transmitter that enables it to be an incoherent scatter radar. And there is this facility in Peru, a very different environment, of course, close to the Earth's equator, uh, where all the field lines essentially are flat with respect to the, the surface of the Earth. Whereas at Tromso, of course, in the high latitude region, they're highly inclined. Uh, the, Russians have an old defense radar now converted to incoherent scatter use. The Ukrainians have, have one at their radio institute in Kharkov. Uh, the Japanese actually have a couple, uh, and the Chinese are developing new facilities, uh, and so are the Indians, although designed for slightly different kinds of science. Why is our location very special? And, and I think our ISCAT's location is very special. Um, we are really uh, at a location which enables us to address some of the core things in the coupling between the Earth and its space environment. So we are under the statistical auroral oval. Here's the, the auroral oval. We're about here. Of course, the, 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 the size changes as a function of magnetic activity. The orientation changes as a function of time of day. But we are spending a lot of time underneath the auroral oval. And of course, here on Svalbard, we sometimes pop out into this polar cap region. We're also... Um, at the edge and, and indeed underneath sometimes the, the region that we call the polar vortex, which is a region of the Earth's upper atmosphere where there is a long-lived low-pressure region that forms in the winter, breaks down in the spring. It, it, it's responsible for the formation of the ozone holes, for instance, at the poles. The dynamics of it as it breaks down are very interesting and have consequences throughout the altitude region of the atmosphere. Let's go on. So, so this is the sort of science that we have done over 35 years. Our bread and butter, of course, is the structure and dynamics of the atmosphere, of the upper atmosphere. The ionosphere, which is a, a difficult region to predict because it's very dynamic, influenced from above, from the Earth's magnetic environment, and from below, from energy coming up through wind and waves into the upper atmosphere. Um, of course, some of the best Known manifestations of the coupling are things like the aurora. So ISCAT has done a lot of work in conjunction with optics, uh, looking at the aurora, looking at the energy spectrum of the particles that make it up, looking at the electrodynamic structures that comprise the aurora, because the aurora is an electric current phenomenon, essentially. Um, um, looking at the, the very energetic particles that, 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 uh, that can characterize the aurora, but also come into the Earth's environment, uh, f through other processes. Um, we can do our own plasma physics, and we, we, we look at naturally occurring plasma physics. The aurora is a great example of naturally occurring plasma physics because it's full of plasma irregularities and waves and so on. Um, but we can also drive our own plasma physics because we have uh, powerful radio transmitters on the ground uh, which can interact with the uh, normal oscillatory frequencies of the ionosphere. So we can couple energy into the ionosphere and look to see what that energy does. We can carry out controlled experiments, basically, and then study the results. Um, we can look at the 
middle atmosphere. So this is the, this is the lowest part of our altitude range. This is around 70 kilometers. Here you can see this is a day with a strong solar flare. So you can see the extra ionization coming in at these low altitudes as a result of a solar X-ray flare. And then here you can see some auroral precipitation. Here you can see some strange stuff, which actually, I think, turns out to be the turbulence caused by waves rising up from the lower atmosphere and breaking, like waves on a beach, as they run out of atmosphere uh, and run out of amplitude. And the turbulence that gives us, especially if things like dust and, 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 uh, and ionization are entrained in it, can act as powerful scatterers. This is a similar phenomenon, the phenomenon of the layered, of the, of the layered mesosphere. It arrives in the, in, the, in the summer, typically, when the region around 80 kilometers above northern Scandinavia is one of the coldest places in, 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 in the world. And it causes the formation of ice, which can then be convolved with meteoric dust, uh, becomes charged, and acts as a very powerful scatterer for the radar to detect. Um, the density structure of the ionosphere is very complicated because it doesn't just modulate as the sun comes up and goes down. There's a lot of transport because the whole polar region is, is convecting dynamically. As it transports, it changes. Uh, it can form uh, strong gradients, for example. Uh, those gradients can striate into small-scale irregularities which affect communications and so on. And this kind of thing is actually very important to study. It has effects on things like transionospheric propagation, looking at signals from satellites and so on. So there's a very practical side to this work as well. Um, we, can use this, we can use the radar as a radio telescope. So people look at the, at the sun, look at the solar wind, uh, and look at uh, the scintillation of radio stars to, to determine things about the properties of the solar wind. We can observe meteors. In some senses, meteors are, our, are part of our noise. I'll show you another part of our noise in a moment. Uh, but the low-altitude specular reflection that we get from meteors uh, uh, can tell us where they come from, how many there are, different, uh, different um, sizes, and so on. Uh, and now, because we've been in action for 35 years, we can look at long-term trends. So we can actually see the cooling of the upper atmosphere over time. And you might say, oh, I think the upper atmosphere is warming. But, of course, the lower atmosphere is warming, more greenhouse Gases are trapping more heat in the lower atmosphere. It makes, means that less heat escapes back into the upper atmosphere. Those layers actually are cooling and contracting as a function of time. So this has been ISCAT. We've been fantastically productive over the years. This is a, our first 30 years of operation. Um, at one time, we were hitting 100 or so papers a year. Over the course of those 30 years, we have had more than 2,000 papers We've had 60 PhD theses in the UK alone. I've been one of them. Uh, I started my PhD in 1984, working with ISCAT when it was very new. We've had uh, several tens of master's theses. This confusogram here shows all the different institutes around the world who have been involved in ISCAT publications over that time and who collaborates with whom, which is a very interesting thing. Uh, and our own institute at RAL is sitting close to the center of the web there, collaborating with lots of people. But you can see institutes in Norway, Sweden, Germany, France. Um, really is a fantastic uh, international collaborative project. Um, but where are we heading? We've got a great radar, but what do we want to do? And these guys have all been directors of the association. Craig Heinzelman is the current one. Um, the guy at the top is Jürgen Rutger, who was director for 12 years. And whenever people asked him what ISCAT was going to do in the future, he said it was going to go up, down, inside, and outside. <laughs> and, and that sounded very glib. And people said, what do you mean, Jürgen? And, and, and actually, it was quite deep, I think, because what he meant was we needed radars to go to higher altitudes, to go further out into near-Earth space. We needed them to go to lower altitudes to probe the connection to the Earth's upper atmosphere. And then we needed to go inside, inside the beam, because our beam is a, basically a pencil beam, but it's, it's a kilometer wide for every 100 kilometers we go up. So to resolve really small scale structures, we need a different way of imaging within the beam. And then we need, of course, a way of going outside that beam to look at the large scale context. And of course, we want to go to continuous operations. This radar is these radars are expensive to operate. They're power hungry. They use klystrons, which are not very stable technology. Some of the klystrons are now very old. Um, and of course, if we were operating all the time, and we we're probably only operating 10 to 20 percent of the time at the moment, we'd have much more chance of capturing uh, rare events uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and really feeding into operational systems. So at the moment, what we've got is something like this. 
we've got a, we've got a, a single beam that's basically acting like a flashlight. Um, what we want is something like this. We want a searchlight, basically, to light up the whole landscape, to show how the atmosphere is coupled in altitude and also laterally. Um, and, and to do that, we need several things. We need more sensitivity than we've got now. Uh, we, our sensitivity is relatively limited, especially at the highest and the lowest altitudes. We need the ability to scan very fast, because at the moment we can't simultaneously image any kind of representative size piece of the upper atmosphere. We have these slow dishes that take half an hour to, to scan from one end of their range to the other. Of course, we like our multi-static data because we have three radars that can look into the same volume. We can see uh, anisotropic parameters. We can see vectors. Um, we want the possibility to generate multiple beams as well, and we can have that now. Um, we want imaging capabilities to go to, go to small-scale structures, and we want this continuous operation. Uh, and now, within the last 10 years, there have become to, become to uh, operate a few radars that are actually beginning to be like this. So these are two of the radars that I showed you on that graph of radars operating around the world. The, the ones in, uh, in Poker Flat in Alaska, and this is in Resolute Bay in Canada. And these are the first kind of imaging incoherent scatter radars. They're operated by our friends in the US, and the kind of thing they can do is, eliminate, is illuminate uh, slices of the upper atmosphere. So you can see, rather than a pencil beam, here's a stack plot with horizontal and vertical resolution showing you a slice through the aurora so you can actually see some of its spatial structure. This is something like what we want to do, um, except we want to go beyond this. So rather than have one of these radars at any given place, we actually want to have five. At least that was our original vision. Um, <laughs> We want to maintain the idea of scattering them around northern Scandinavia with good geometry for, for, for vector determination. We want to have full digital beam forming at all the sites. We want to have much more power and much more sensitivity than we've got now. And of course, we want to change our transmitter technology so we get away from our old Klystrons and go to, to solid state transmitters, which can operate continuously. Um, and during this... Uh, evolution, we first of all kind of had this idea in, in about 2002. A few people sat down at the European Geophysical Union in, in Nice and said, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this? And we actually then began to apply for money to design the thing. We applied to, for, 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 to money from the European Union under their Framework 6 program, and we thought initially that we'd put this application in and gain some experience and, and the next one would be better. Uh, in fact, we got money at the first go, um, and so we actually started in 2005 a four-year design study to develop some principles, and we thought at the start that we'd be building something that looked like this forest of antennas here. Um, we actually made something that looked a little bit like that. Um, one of the very useful things we were able to do is get the science community together and get it talking about what it wanted. We did a lot of outreach, so we published a lot of articles, uh, at the same time, we reached out to some very similar projects. So those of you who know about radio astronomy might recognize a few, uh, a few characters from the SKA project here. Uh, and it's no accident, actually, that what we've ended up with looks a bit like some of the low-frequency radio telescope technologies that you might have seen in presentations at these meetings. Having done our FP6 design study, we were added to what's called the S3 roadmap. And this is a, a, a roadmap of future European research infrastructures. Being on it's opened a lot of doors for us. In, in fact, it opened the FP7 door and got us money for what's called the preparatory phase, where we do some more development. We actually do some, 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 some uh, field tests, some prototypes. We've been able to reach out to the local communities. Um, and we are now in a phase called preparation for production, where we're going to put a test array in Tromso and begin to test it. Um, one of the nice things, as I said, that we were able to do was to initiate discussions with our science community. So uh, Anita Aikio and myself got uh, funding to run around Europe, basically, and talk to the different science communities using ISCAT. And basically, with each one of those communities, we sat them down and said, what does a new radar do for you? What, will you, what would you want from a new radar? And they gave us then a long list of things. Uh, some of which were impossible, some of which were contradictory. Uh, and, and that was okay, we expected that, because we were then able to take that list back to the engineers and say, these guys want this, these guys want this, how much of this can they have? 
And so the final design was really a compromise between the aspirations of the scientists uh, uh, and the, uh, the reservations or practicalities of the engineering community. Um, we published this thing in the open literature. Uh, so we had it peer-reviewed so that nobody could say our science case wasn't robust. So you can go and read it in Progress on Earth and Planetary Sciences from last year. Um, so the, the science targets in some ways are the same science targets, but now they have a little bit of a spin because we've actually started working with some new partners. So one of the things that we are going to do, as well as being a purely science radar, is we're going to be partly operational. So we've been talking to the uh, European Space Agency about their Space Situational Awareness Program and how we can make this radar operational. So a radar that, was, that is always on, how can it feed into the, the, uh, the, the modelling, um, the, uh, the situational awareness of the upper atmosphere to tell us where things like aurora, um, irregularities, scintillating uh, regions are... Um, we can do all this good science, we can track meteors, we can do solar wind, we can look at all the energy coupling from up and down, now in three dimensions rather than two. Uh, and as well, we can apply a lot of the novel techniques that were, that were developed with IceGap but could never be implemented on our old hardware, uh, which would increase our time resolution, increase our accuracy, and so on. Um, Another thing we've been talking to the space, uh, to the, uh, space agency about is, is satellites and space debris. This is another example of our noise. I told you meteors were our noise, but we get a lot of echoes from hard targets. We throw them away before we, before we begin to analyse the data scientifically, but actually those data are very useful to people. Large cluttering objects uh, and their positions in orbit are things that people want to know about. Uh, and we have a, a very nice, uh, I think, security policy which allows us only to look at uh, white-listed objects in the public domain, and small space debris objects. Um, there were some sensitivities about what these dishes might be able to do, but I think we've, we've answered those in, in the right way. So this is what we've come up with. This is iSCAT 3D as, it, as we plan it at the moment. Uh, nice artist's impression, thanks to our friends in Japan. You can see that the thing is inherently scalable. It's made up of these small panels, uh, 91 antennas on each, uh, you can build up a large collecting area. This is about 400 metres across, I think, uh, in, in, in the design that we, we want to have at the moment. Um, and in, in the initial phase, we want three of these radars. Here's our new transmitter. It's, in, it's going to be in Shiboten in Norway. Uh, the reason is for moving across the mountains, we're over here in Tromso at the moment on the seacoast, is the weather's much better in Shiboten. There's less snow. Uh, there's more clear sky, so we can do more stuff with optics. <laughs> Um, it's still a, a, a pretty good location in terms of things like power and roads and, and, uh, and infrastructure. Um, we can support rocket flights out of ES range. Uh, we will hopefully support rocket flights out of Andoya too. Um, so the location is good. We've got good liaison with the local community. All the land we want is state-owned. Uh, we are going to put two other sites... Uh, one near Berefors in northern Sweden and one near Karasavanto in northern Finland. Um, in our second stage, we would start with a 5 megawatt transmitter. At the moment, we've got 2 megawatts. Uh, in our second stage, we would upgrade that to 10 megawatts, which would widen our coverage area uh, and, of course, give us more sensitivity for high and low altitudes. Then, in the third stage, we would add a, th a fourth site at Andoya. There is a rocket range there. There's some very interesting science that we could we could support with that. And in our final stage, we would add our fifth site uh, further south in Sweden. Now, at the moment, what we're trying to do is phase one. Uh, phase one uh, will have our central site in, 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 in Shiboten in northern Sweden. Oops, sorry. Uh, it's actually going to be laid out not as a single large array. There will be one very large array, like the one you saw in the picture, but there'll also be some outlying imaging arrays, and that enables us to get inside the beam and do spatial structure. Um, we are playing already with some ideas on how we can do this beam forming using uh, radio telescope type systems. So this is a system called Kyra. It lives in the north of Finland. It's very similar to those of you who know about LOFAR. It's very similar to the LOFAR antennas. Uh, and this is a facility owned by the University of Oulu in Finland. We're playing with it as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a demonstrator array for ISCAT. And you can see this is incoherent scatter data using our transmitter in, in, in Tromso, 
received with the dishes in, with, with this uh, receiving array in Finland. You can see it does the same thing exactly as an incoherent scatter radar. This is where we're going to put our test subarray. These are our existing dishes in Tromso in northern Norway. Our test array is going here in the next, in the next um, year, so probably next sum this summer. Uh, and what we're going to put on it is one of those 91 modules that we're going to use in the standard array, uh, which we will just test to make sure that we can get power out of it. We can see test signals. We can't really see the ionosphere with something this small, but we could see some spacecraft, for instance, and, and just check that it works as it should. And there are manufacturers now helping us build this thing. So this is the issue. Um, how much do we need to do that? We need uh, about 60 million to, to produce our phase one, which is what we've told the funding agencies we're going to do. At the moment, we have about 75% of that, thanks to our friends, mostly to our friends in the Nordic countries, who have put their money on the table first. Um, at the moment, this is our capital column. There is a zero sitting there in the UK. Um, we applied for money from the autumn statement um, through bees, through our friends at NERC. Um, we are still in that process, and we know that our bid is not dead, uh, but we have no resolution yet on how that money will actually come to us or whether it will. The, the autumn statement money that was allocated for science has not yet been divided. We're working very hard with the Japanese. There is a little bit of money in their pot at the moment. Um, we are hoping that they will get the same sort of amount of money as us. Uh, we're working with the Chinese because uh, whether we get Chinese money or not depends on what's going to be in the next Chinese five-year plan. So what we hope to do, if all goes well, even without the Chinese money, is to get ourselves up to uh, somewhere around 75 million by the end of this year. And that will enable us to build phase one and most of phase two, actually. Um, uh, and I think that's a realistic possibility, uh, but it's far from being a done deal. So this is my summary slide. Um, IFCAT is 35 years old. It's very successful, but we have plans to go much further. We want to build the leading facility of its kind in the world, and it will not just be a science facility, but it will also be an operational facility that works with things like space weather and space debris. We have done the right things so far, I think, to get ourselves established in the European framework as an ESPRI infrastructure. We've gone through EU-supported project phases for design and preparation. We're very grateful for their support. Um, we've in the process developed what I think is a very good science case which has been published in the open literature uh, and now our goal really is to secure the capital funding. We have basically the agreements to build on the land if we can get the money and we have something like 70, between 70 and 75 percent pledged already but the next few months now will be critical in whether this dream lives or dies so if you see me uh, looking very miserable over the next year um, you'll know it's failed. If, if we've succeeded, then I'll hopefully come back in a few years and tell you what we're doing. But thank you very much. Ian, you mentioned that there were a couple of other IceCat people in the audience. Why not uh, um, so, introduce them? Uh, let's see who's here. So Anna Sui is here, who's from University College, who's worked, uh, worked extensively with IceCat over the years. Um, Matthew is, is runs our database, who's sitting next to Anasuya. Um, who else is here? Did, there were several people who were at the... Uh, oh, Mike Lockwood, who is one of the prime exploiters of ISCAT over, And I don't know how many tens of papers Mike has contributed to that, that list, but many. Um, and there were several others of us who were here over at the VAS uh, earlier on today. Yeah. So thanks to all of those. What's the best discovery you can imagine? <laughs> Oh, that, you, you see, well, we're often asked the question, what is the Higgs boson of ice cat? I always say that that's the wrong question. There is no single Higgs boson. I think the, the achievement that, that would make the whole community the happiest, I think, and it would be a collective achievement of the whole community, is to go as far down the road as we can towards modelling and predictability of what is a very dynamic environment. So I told you that the upper atmosphere is driven by energy from below, it's driven by energy from above. There is a lot of convection and dynamics associated with it. So it's highly structured, it's highly dynamic. Does that mean we can never model it? 
Clearly not, because we have models that work to some degree already. I think what we're trying to do, not just because of it, it improves our scientific understanding, but it improves the practical use we make of the ionosphere, it is to go as far as we can to, to actually predicting where the aurora will be, where the, where the convection will be, where the strong gradients will be, and that's the thing, where, how the satellite, how spacecraft drag affects satellites. Those are the things that people want to know, and that's the jigsaw that we're helping to build, I think. Do you want one, Colin? <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the answer is um, we will, we do plan to decommission the Tromso, Kirana, and Sotankula sites. We'll keep Svalbard. Uh, and the reason is that Svalbard is higher latitude, it's on open field lines, it's essentially somewhat different science. And it's newer. That radar is only 20 years old compared to our 30 year old radars further south. Um, we have been approached by various people, actually, who would be interested. So one possibility is to repurpose those radars uh, for meteorological applications. So there was, there's some interest in that. Um, there's some interest in, 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 in making them kind of test beds for new radio techniques. Um, so our friends in Sorankula are interested in that. Um, in fact, we, we thought it was going to be a very expensive exercise to decommission those radars, but it's not. It turns out there's so much metal in them that the scrap value alone uh, makes it actually quite cheap to decommission them. So, there we are. Ian, I could remind you that at the opening of the original ice gap, the King of Sweden said that he would buy the VHF because he thought it was beautiful. Well, there we go. <laughs> Is he still alive? <laughs> That's interesting. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Uh, let me just ask, you, you sort of alluded just in passing to, uh, slightly coyly, to these, uh, I don't know, um, I presume military uh, satellites which you presumably pick up, but you somehow you throw the data away we, we or do. you lock it up? No, or? Uh, no we throw it away. And, 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 <laughs> and, 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 and uh, this, is, this has actually become quite a sensitive issue to the extent that I have to be a little bit careful what I say about it. Um, if you think about it, uh, it's obvious that a very powerful radar intersecting a very large or <coughs> relatively large solid object is going to get a very large echo out of it. And we are going to see that echo. Uh, in principle, it means that everything that drifts over us above a few centimetres in size, we can see. And when people realised that that was the case, and they realised that the Chinese and the Russians and so on were using our system, that started to make people a little nervous. Um, now... What we have decided, what we decided to do, therefore, uh, was basically to clip out all those strong echoes from the system and just junk them before anybody in the science community gets the data. So nobody sees that stuff. Um, however, uh, there is the possibility, if you want to do it, to apply to IceGap to, to look at the stuff that we would normally throw away. And if you do that, then IceGap will look at this and say, OK, is this something we really think we should be doing and can do? Basically, it will come down probably to comparing it with the ESA whitelist. Um, and this is a known object. We want to track it. And there are good reasons to track it, of course. We want to look at what the, the heating of the upper atmosphere does right. to the orbits and stuff like that. Um, you might well find that people let you do it. I mean, there, were, there, were, there was a contract going on with the European Space Agency now to track debris fragments. Debris fragments are fine because they're small. They couldn't possibly be anything secret. Um, so that's the sort of logic that we're, we're employing. OK, we, oh, one last oh. quick question there. Does that, open up, does that open up any possibilities of funding from the airline industry and from the space debris uh, um, people in terms of oh, yes. selling on your data? It, it might well do. Um, so we have been talking to the, the European Space Agency. There, there, there is a project um, called Space Surveillance and Tracking in Europe. Um, and it's a, it's a slightly strange thing because it's co-funded by the European Union and by the European Space Agency. Uh, and, and so U UK is a member, actually, of both sides of the... Well, it's, been, it's a member of the EU-funded part of that study at the moment. We've just bought our way into the ESA-funded part of it, too. Um, of course, what we do in any EU-funded programme is now a, a, a strangely moot point, and we don't know quite how we're going forward. Um, but... <laughs> The ESA Space Debris Programme has been interested in IceGap for a number of years, and if you look at their website, you'll see pictures of IceGap all over it, which actually they use 
kind of without asking us, but, but we've been talking to them, as I say, for many years, so it's okay. Um, so, yeah, th- th- I mean, if we really find ourselves in a funding issue and can't build this thing, it may be that we'll even turn to Easter and say, we've got no money for Okay, on that happy note of not knowing where we're going, um, we need to move on. Ian, thank you very much indeed. So, our final uh, presentation today is uh, from...